Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn. Coming up next on the Grace Pipeline, learn how to be at peace with your past. Please join us now. Welcome to the Grace Pipeline. For the last several programs, we've been talking about justification. And today, we're going to learn how justification can bring you peace. Forgive me for meddling, but I must ask, is there a sin from your past that haunts you? Have you ever confessed to God, received His forgiveness, but you just cannot forgive yourself? Well, this program is for you. Today, we will summarize God's legal transaction of justification, which can bring you peace with the past. This series follows the Bible study book, God Privileged Me to Write, which is also titled The Grace Pipeline. If you're using your companion book to follow along, today we begin on page 75 of chapter 5. To, now, to better grasp the idea of justification. Let's first look back to the scriptures that were used by the early Christian church, which was nothing less than the writings of the Old Testament, and that supplied the foundation for understanding the teachings of the New Testament. Deuteronomy 25.1 provides us with an insight to the legal action of justification. The scripture says, if there is a dispute, Come to court that the judges may judge them and justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. In this setting, a judge heard the case against an accused and made a judgment. If there was insufficient evidence to prove guilt, he cleared them and declared them innocent or justified. Of course, if evidence existed, he condemned the guilty. In the Old Testament, God warns he will not justify the wicked. His anger is aroused toward judges who accept bribes to acquit the guilty or condemn the innocent. Anyone who perverts justice is an abomination to the Lord. So weighing the Hebrew understanding, we see that justification is a legal action. It is performed by a judge. Condemnation and justification are forensic terms. They have to do with examining the evidence to decide questions that arise from a crime. They are polar opposites. To condemn means to declare an accused party guilty and worthy of punishment. To justify means to pronounce an acquittal of the charges, making an official declaration that the accused is innocent. We all know we are guilty of sin. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If we are guilty of sin, we are worthy of punishment. Ah, oh, but thank God that the verse ends with a comma and the rest of the story is told in the following verse. Listen with amazement to the love and redemption God provides us through his grace pipeline as I read Romans 3:23 and 24 together and it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God comma being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus Justification is the sovereign legal act of a holy and just God. It results from the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Let's summarize this legal process. Romans 5, 8, and 9 tells us that God loved us while we were still sinners and sent Christ to die for us that we might be justified by his blood. Through repentance, we receive the remission of our past offenses. The blood of Christ covers the forensic evidence that stood against us, and redemption and forgiveness are the pardon. As we considered in a past program, Romans 4.25 tells us that Christ was raised to secure our justification. The resurrected Savior 
serves as our high priest who's blotting out our sins in the heavenly sanctuary and he's continually interceding as our advocate. Romans 5, 17 and 18 clearly states that Christ's righteous act becomes our gift of righteousness. His righteousness, his perfect character stands in place of our character and robed in his righteousness, his credit is given to our heavenly record and that puts us in right legal standing with God. What is the result of Christ standing in as our substitute, living the perfect life we never lived and dying the death we deserved? The demands of divine justice are satisfied. There are no longer legal grounds to justly inflict the penalty of sin. God declares us free of guilt and he grants us an acquittal. By his grace, justification is ours. And once justified, you can declare I am just as if I had never sinned. This is the good news of the gospel of grace. When we understand God's plan for us, we can celebrate his goodness as Paul did in Romans 8, 31 through 33. And here he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bear a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Quite an exciting promise, isn't it? Now let's turn our focus to Zechariah chapter 3. This is an important Old Testament passage that demonstrates justification has always been by grace through faith in the promised Messiah. Let me set this up for you before we read. In Zechariah chapter 3, the prophet records a vision that graphically portrays God's gracious plan of both imputed righteousness, or righteousness that has been credited to our account, and of justification. In the first verse, he speaks of seeing the angel of the Lord, who Bible scholars agree and have identified as Jesus Christ before his incarnation. So there in Zechariah 3, Joshua is standing before him, and the accuser of the brethren, Satan, stands to oppose Joshua. Zechariah receives this vision following the release of a remnant group of Israel's nation from Babylonian bondage. God's justice had sanctioned the fiery trial of their exile. The people had rebelled against him in action and attitude, and had warranted the sufferings of condemnation which finally brought them to repentance. Once again, the merciful maker secured their release from captivity and returned them to Jerusalem. Joshua was the first appointed high priest of the returning remnant. Now in vision, the prophet sees Joshua standing as the representative of the people before Jesus. He was clothed in filthy garments. He is defiled with sin, and Satan points an accusing finger of blame at Joshua. With violent opposition, he lists the transgressions of the covenant people, arguing that God should not restore them to divine favor. Did Satan have grounds for his allegations? He knew that God has a perfect standard of right doing and right being. He knew the Lord's Ten Commandments of love are a reflection of his righteous character and that God requires created beings to observe his divine law as an expression of their love, respect, and covenant faith. Certainly this nation had all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. The Bible is clear in both the Old and the New Testaments that the wages of sin is death. Satan reasoned they deserve to die and question how the great God of justice could ignore their transgressions. So the arch accuser standing there underestimated the love, mercy, and grace of the Lord. Joshua's knees must have been trembling. But then in Zechariah 3, let me read to you what happens. Verses 2 through 5. 
The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. This is remission of sin. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. There's imputed righteousness. And I said, Let them put on a clean turban on his head. That's justification. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. The vision revealed God's continued plan of remission of sin and imputed righteousness by grace. The special turban that was placed on the high priest had a golden plate with the inscription, Holiness to the Lord. In vision, this represented the restoration of the priesthood. God declared Joshua and his people justified by grace and reconciled to him. Let me tell you something. You may not have thought about this, but Satan is not omnipresent. He is a created being with limited presence to only one place at a time. He assigns his unholy alliance of demons, those fallen angels, to lure us into temptation and then to work as CSI agents, the crime scene investigators, who go around collecting forensic evidence to present against us. The enemy wags an accusatory finger at us, declaring our guilt, and trying to hand off a baton of condemnation that we may use it on ourselves to beat our heads and bash our hopes. Don't accept it. Don't be the devil's fool, or else you will never experience peace with God. Many years ago, a precious friend of mine lived in the darkness of a drug and alcohol addiction that led to a promiscuous lifestyle. Hearing her testimony for the first time totally caught me off guard. I could not believe this innocent Christ-like woman filled with love and heavenly wisdom had ever dwelled anywhere but in the light of the Lord. She is a brand plucked from the fire, and a living memorial to God's grace of salvation. Although she received divine deliverance from sin, sordid memories of the past haunted her for some time afterward, and she could not forgive herself for the damage that she had done. So approaching her one day after church, her pastor put his finger on the problem, asking her, do you believe God has forgiven you? Well, of course, she replied. And he said, then don't you think it's a little arrogant of you not to forgive yourself? Aren't you putting yourself above God? Well, that's ridiculous, she steamed. I'm doing no such thing. And she stormed off. His comments infuriated her. But later that day, as the Lord helped her to reflect on the wisdom of the pastor's counsel, she slowly began to accept it as truth. The life-changing breakthrough she so desperately needed occurred, and she dropped that baton of self-condemnation. She forgave herself at last. God cleansed her conscience of guilt, silencing the torment of self-accusation, and giving her confidence to draw ever closer to his throne of grace. She lives at peace with her past now and with her Lord. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 3, 20 and 21, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Feelings of condemnation cause a guilty conscience before God. Guilt keeps us at an arm's distance from his embrace. Our sympathetic Savior wants to give us peace of mind so that we will feel confident in his presence. If we repent and depend on Christ as our propitiation, which we've studied in an earlier program, means to cover sin, when we accept Christ as our covering for sin, our propitiation, he makes atonement for our sin 
covering them over. And Paul tells us in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. To be in Christ is to have a personal relationship with Him. Have you confessed your sins and asked God for the gift of repentance? Are you in Christ? If so, because of your relationship with Christ, God has pronounced you justified. There is no longer any basis for His condemnation or for your self-condemnation. Where you once felt alienated from Him, you can now draw close with confidence. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 is one of my favorite verses. Let me read this to you from the Amplified. Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God does not want you to dwell on the past. He does not want you to dwell on former mistakes from which you have been justified. What he's saying here is release the past and press forward. You know, Paul makes that clear also in Colossians 1, 20 through 20, uh, chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, that when God forgives you, he provides the blessing of peace and the power of his promise linked with love is to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach if you steadfastly continue in the faith. It is through Christ that we have access by faith to God's grace pipeline, as Paul noted in Romans 5, 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Stand firm in Christ and you will continue to have access by faith into the bountiful blessings of God's grace. This is our fourth program on justification by faith. We have examined how God can be a just judge and at the same time, the one who justifies us. We have considered the mercy seat covering, the seat of God's judgment throne and how Christ is symbolically our mercy seat covering. We have proven from scripture that it is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. His righteousness credited to our account by virtue of our relationship with him that justifies us freely by God's grace and through our faith. We've also proven that there is no other way, no other process by which we may be justified. We have examined Paul's teaching, which proves, particularly in Galatians 5, 4, that if we attempt to be justified by works, we have fallen from grace. But if we stop here, there will be someone out there who still wants to argue that the apostles Paul and James were at odds in their teaching, one saying that we are justified by grace and the other claiming that we are justified by works. I don't want to leave any stone unturned that might hinder your understanding of this vital topic. So let's briefly consider what these two apostles taught. Paul makes a glorious defense of the gospel of grace in his letter to the Romans. In chapters 3 through 5, he presents the picture of man's condition before justification and sets forth the gift of God's grace that freely justifies the human race. Let's look at what he says in Romans 3, 24 through 31. Being justified freely, he writes, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, that God might be just 
and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul argues good works are not the cause of justification. No one can be justified by conformity to the law or dependence upon religious rites and ceremonies. Justification is a gift from God, received by faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice and his imputed righteousness. Now you'll notice that concerned someone might misapply this teaching. Paul quickly added that faith establishes the principle of the law. The Lord did not give the law in vain. It pointed man to Christ, who perfectly fulfilled God's requirements. And as we recognize all that he has done for us, we will be eager to please him. Anyone in relationship with Christ will uphold his eternal principles of morality. While good works are not the cause of our justification, they certainly come as the consequence. In Romans 4, and I believe it's 1 through 25, Paul uses the Old Testament and the patriarch Abraham as a witness to God's unchanging plan of salvation. Through faith and in spite of seemingly hopeless circumstances. The child, the childless Abraham believed God's promise that he would become the father of a great nation and God accounted it to him as righteousness. Paul argues that the uncircumcised patriarch Abraham was justified by grace through the righteousness of faith. And then Paul makes it clear in Romans 4, 11, that it was only afterward that the law was added and Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while he was still uncircumcised. Circumcision was merely the outward evidence of an inward working that God had accomplished in Abraham, a sign to the patriarch and his descendants that the righteousness granted him was by faith. In the same fashion, Christians today, our baptism is a sign of the faith and justification we have already experienced. So throughout his letter to the Romans, Paul's focus was from the standpoint of man's condition before justification. Let me repeat this because I don't want you to miss it. Throughout his entire letter to the Romans, Paul's focus was from the standpoint of man's condition before justification. Now, in contrast, the Apostle James uses the example of faithful Abraham as he sets forth a different aspect of justification, focusing from the standpoint of man's condition after being justified. In James 2, verses 20 through 24, James writes, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You see, what James is pointing out is that God's faithful friend Abraham maintained his right standing with God through actions of obedience prompted by faith. James argues that after justification, we will conform to the Lord's commandments as evidence that our faith is sincere. Genuine faith seeks to be obedient to God's will. We cannot expect to remain justified by faith while living in sin. Justification by grace 
leads to sanctification by grace, resulting in a life that's separated from evil and set apart for God and leading to personal holiness as we develop the character of Christ. Our Lord Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And I've added some notes here. He taught us, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. There's justification. As we forgive our debtors, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's sanctification. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. By the blood of Christ and the grace of God, our sin debt is forgiven, and we are anxious not to offend our Heavenly Father again. We desire sanctification. Personal holiness is not the cause for our justification, but comes as the consequence of justification. Justification is only by grace. It takes but a moment as we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And on the basis of Christ's imputed righteousness, God declares us justified, which entitles us to all the advantages and rewards of his perfect record of obedience. The Apostle Peter states this perfectly in 1 Peter 2.24, where he says, who himself, speaking of Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Justification leads to sanctification. Sanctification is also a work of grace, the progressive work of a lifetime. God sanctifies us by Christ's imparted righteousness, which remarkable gift we will focus on in our next program. But first I want to ask, I hope you've noticed that difference between what Paul and James did. Remember, Paul's argument in Romans is justification before. It's, he's talking about a man before his justification whereas James talks about it afterwards. So what we want is to find sanctification. And yoked with Christ, he empowers us to walk in harmony with his will. Faith is the only method by which we can seize hold of Christ and his righteousness. From start to finish, it is from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. So please remember Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord.